All right. So welcome to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'm Dana Ripper with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Ethan Duke, also from MRBO, is here with us tonight. And MRBO's mission is conservation via science, education, and advocacy. And we have put together this 12-part webinar series to hopefully inspire and inform folks um, to become more involved in conservation of our natural resources and our fellow species and to take action for them. So very excited tonight to have Steve Boo back with us. I have seen Steve present several times and always learn a whole bunch um, about his work and about insects. Steve is a natural history biologist for the Missouri Department of Conservation based out of Columbia, Missouri. He previously worked in the Northwest region for 11 years and also worked as the park ecologist for Forest Park Forever in St. Louis. He has a master's in ecosystem science and management from Duke University and an undergraduate degree from Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. Steve works to conserve and manage rare species and ecosystems of all sorts with a particular interest in plants, insects, and their interactions. Steve, take it away. All right. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us tonight to talk about the little things that run the world. <clears throat> I mean, I'm battling a little bit of illness, so hopefully my voice holds out for the hour. Um, we're going to talk through some different species of insects and insects in general. And I think we decided before the webinar that uh, maybe the best way to do questions is by, kind of by taxa. So kind of talk about some butterflies and moths, and then we'll stop for some questions, then we'll talk about some bees, and then we'll talk about, I think, regal fritillaries, and then maybe a little, and we'll stop for more questions after the bees, after the fritillaries, and then the very end that I really want to get to is kind of the what do we do about things. And um, you can also take any questions at the end. A uh, special shout out to all the folks that I've seen that I know from Northwest, Columbia, St. Louis, and folks I don't know yet from around the state. Thanks for joining us to hear about some things that we know very little about. Um, Missouri's imperiled insects with a question mark is appropriate because our knowledge of insects is far behind pretty much every other taxa you might hear about in these webinars. Uh, if you're familiar with Styermark's Flora of Missouri, first published in what, 63, I believe, 62 in there. And, you know, that was kind of the groundbreaking work laying out which plants were found where across the state. We uh, were not there for insects. We're not there for really any guild of insects. Uh, we're still in the discovery phase, which makes it an exciting and fun time to be working on them, but also means we have to be comfortable with a lot of uncertainty. That's going to be a theme running through the talk over the uh, next hour. So when we think about biodiversity and we think about managing and protecting biodiversity, what we really need to be thinking about is insects. And I'm biased. I have freely admit that. But we estimate, and we don't know, but we estimate that there are at least 25,000 species of insects in the state of Missouri. Compare that to some of the more charismatic, the big uh, megafauna, if you will. If you think about mammals, which a lot of us think of as being wildlife, and they, they are wildlife, but they make up that tiny yellow sliver on this pie chart. Insects vastly outnumber every other taxa. Plants are in the next most diverse taxa, and there's about 3,000 species of plants known from the state of Missouri. So if we're really concerned about biodiversity, about protecting the world as it is, if we ignore insects, uh, we do so at our own peril. Put all this into perspective, <clears throat> the numbers you see here are a little bit dated, I just realized. Um, so there's 434 species of birds known from the state of Missouri. Um, there's more bees known from the state of Missouri in terms of species. That number is about 500 nowadays. Um, more bees known from the state of Missouri than there are birds. And if you think about the birds that you know, um, inhabiting every possible niche, every partition on the landscape from wetlands to, you know, sand prairies to, to tall grass prairie to glades, 
you know, there's a bee that inhabits every niche, same as, you know, there's niche partitioning between great blue herons and bald eagles. And the differences between these species can often be just as much as there is between different bird species. So that's really important to keep in mind when we're talking about even just managing something simple, like managing for bees, it's still a pretty huge task. Um, if we want to consider grasshoppers of Missouri, there's as many grasshoppers as there are reptiles within the state. Um, you know, I've had a coworker tell me before, like, there's more than just one. Yeah, you know, there's a ton of these guys, and they all have different life stories. They all have different life histories. They live different places and do different things. And if we don't understand what it is, where they are, and what they do, it's impossible to conserve them. And it's really critical to acknowledge and for everybody to realize that for most of these species, we just don't know. Uh, we've not had a good dipterist, a fly expert work within the state. We have no idea what our fly diversity looks like. Um, we can kind of guesstimate on some of the bigger, easy to identify species like the robber flies. But even if we start getting into surfids and all the parasitic flies, you know, the diversity that's out there is just completely unknown, completely understood. And that makes managing and conserving it really challenging. And that's what we're going to talk about. So a good example of managing the unknown is the rattlesnake master borer moth. Um, we've got the privilege to work with this species about 10, 12, 15 years ago when it was first petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. It's in a suite of moths called the borer moths. They're stem borers. And this is the rattlesnake master borer moth. As the name implies, it is solely dependent, we believe, on rattlesnake master, or Ingenium yuccifolium, as a host plant. Um, so this little charismatic ca grub caterpillar you see here uh, begins its life as an egg laid on the leaf of rattlesnake master. And as it grows, it slowly bores its way down to the roots. Um, you can often find this species by looking for rattlesnake master that's doing really poorly. A lot of times in our prairie, in the absence of a drought, rattlesnake master is a pretty robust plant. It does really well, you know, it blooms most years. It does really well in landscaping situations as long as it has enough calcium. But when it's infested by these rattlesnake master borer moss, the plants look really wilted. They look small, the leaves yellow up. Basically, this thing is preventing nutrient transfer from the roots to the leaves back and forth. It's not the only papiopema that will use rattlesnake master, but it's uh, the main one on the tall grass prairies where it occurs. So when this thing, so this is kind of a cryptic species. Um, the adults are really hard to find. They fly for about two weeks in October and uh, they don't feed as adults. They fly at night. And traditionally, you have to be out there with a black light, which doesn't work very well, or you can soak a rope in some wine and hang it out in the prairie, and occasionally they'll come to that. But this species was unknown for Missouri in 2011, 2012, let's say. Um, Richard Heisman, who wrote the book Butterflies and Maws in Missouri, had surveyed for this, uh, couldn't find it, so it was assumed not to exist in the state of Missouri. You know, these, there's about three people in the world that really are experts on papiopemas, and I'm not one of them in case you get any crazy ideas. Um, but we, you know, worked with, well, let's look at the life cycle a little bit <clears throat> first. So the eggs hatch and it bores in. Uh, it goes completely dormant. It goes into pupation in about late July, early August in the hottest part of the year. And then it emerged from that pupa again in October. It mates, lays eggs, and dies. So one of the reasons we never knew about this species here is because most lepidopterists aren't out in October at night. You know, the diversity is pretty low. There's just not a lot of interesting things. Generally, we'll follow, you know, first frost to last or last frost to first frost for our surveys. Um, but these things have always stymied us, which we didn't know because we were just not out looking in the right place at the right time. But it was petitioned for listing. Well, let's go back. It was petitioned for listing. And, uh, you know, before it was listed, Fish and Wildlife Service, Paul McKenzie in particular, said, hold on, hold on. We've got thousands and thousands of acres of prairie. You know, we've got lots of rattlesnake master. This thing could be here. We just may have never have looked for it right. 
So we got together a bunch of long haired hippies. Um, the gentleman on my right, who's not, well, the guy who's not me is Jim Weicker. He's one of the world experts on Papia Pema. So we brought him to the state and we started looking. This is at Tucker Prairie, uh, right outside Kingdom City. And I mean, that was kind of the first place we looked. It was just a training for MDC, DNR staff to try to find this species. And lo and behold, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of stems infested with the rattlesnake master borer moth. So, you know, in his first day of surveying, essentially, we found not only a new species for the state, but a species that's doing remarkably well. And Tucker Prairie to this day is one of the best populations of rattlesnake master borer moth in the entire world. Um, before we found it in Missouri, the species was known from less than 10 sites in Illinois. Um, here's a picture of Rattlesnake Master on your right. And uh, that is not a Rattlesnake Master borer moth, but just uh, you never know what you're gonna find when you start poking around inside these species. So it was known from you know less than 10 sites in the world. And so you know in one day we were able to increase the known population of this species by an order of magnitude. And you can see here the sites where we did find it. So in Illinois, all those sites were, you know, under 10 acres. They were all linear, small strips following around railroad prairies. If you're interested in knowing more about Illinois' populations, there was an article that just came out in last month's Natural Areas Journal um, by the Illinois Natural History Survey um, documenting some of their populations. But you can see here that we found uh, eight counties with the species, 17 sites. Places like Tucker Prairie, Wakanta, um, all of our big prairies have always harbored this species, um, but nobody knew it. You know, it had been in out there for since time immemorial at Tucker Prairie, since the glaciers left this area, perhaps, and the prairie reestablished. This moth may have moved right back in, and it had been under our nose. You know, this is a research study area. It's a natural area. It's one of the most well-documented prairies in the state. And there's still species that we don't know that are out there, um, just surviving, doing their thing. So now have, you know, really increased the order, the known populations of this thing by several orders of magnitude. And as a result, also found it in Arkansas, Kansas, North Carolina, Kentucky. Um, I think the Iowa one that I have on here is a, a mistake. Known, known populations in Iowa yet. But we didn't find any north of, well, not many more, one site north of the Missouri River. Tucker Prairie is about the only place we could find it established in North Missouri. Um, so there's still a lot of options for managing this species. But, you know, substantially as a result of finding this species, we were able to successfully prevent it from being listed under the Endangered Species Act. And those of us who are in the conservation field, um, you know, the Endangered Species Act is kind of a, a double-edged sword. Like, on one hand, it provides a lot of protection for the species, but for a species that's relatively common, as the rattlesnake master borer moth, moth turned out to be, uh, we currently have it listed as S3, which is the basically as common as it can be where we still track the populations. Um, if this thing were listed as federally threatened or endangered, um, it would essentially hamper our management of the prairies, manage the the prescribed fire programs, the invasive species control, um, because it, any take of that species would then be prohibited um, by the feds. So our goal when managing rare species is generally to keep them common enough that the Endangered Species Act doesn't have to be involved. And we do that through uncertainty. We had no idea this species was out there, but by burning no more than a third of the prairie, ideally a quarter at a time, we were able to provide habitat for this species, uh, maintain it on the landscape, despite the fact that we didn't even know it existed. So to contrast with the species that um, was common but seemingly rare is the species that, in my opinion, is truly, truly rare. Uh, this is Linda's roadside skipper. Um, skippers are sometimes considered to be the most primitive group of butterflies. Uh, you probably have them in your yard. There's several common species that inhabit, you know, probably every unpaved acre in the state. But Linda's roadside skipper is not one of those. So this thing was known from eight locations, 24 different collections. 
um, and was listed as G2, G3, uh, which means globally, this thing is, is fairly rare. Um, uh, G run rank would be more rare and that'd be known from maybe 10 to 12 sites in the world. This thing's known from maybe 25 or 30, ranging in Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, potentially Kansas. I believe there's an Illinois record and maybe one in Kentucky. Um, but this thing is always seemingly rare. So Missouri has long been thought to be the epicenter of one of the, or along the Ozarks are the epicenter for the diversity of this species. It was described by Freeman uh, down in Arkansas in, I believe, the 70s. And, you know, just not a lot of work had been done with it. So skippers are notorious for being challenging to identify. And the roadside skippers, at least this uh, group of them, is probably the most difficult to identify of any, of any of the groups of skippers. You end up looking at color patterns. You got to look for scales on top of scales. Um, so really rare, but also difficult to identify and difficult to survey for. One of the main characters for this little brown butterfly, a uh, primitive butterfly skipper, looks a lot like a moth, is the uh, grizzled underside of the hind wing. So you can see the kind of lighter scales interspersed with the dark brown there. Um, there you go, one record from Illinois in 1896. Um, Dale Schweitzer, who worked for Nature Serve and was responsible for providing estimates of rarity for just about all the species that had all the insect species that had rarity estimates uh, through, you know, through 2011, at least, had said, we know very little about this skipper. And I've been working with this species for over 10 years now, and I can't say that we know a whole lot more. Um, so difficulty in ID, if you look at that last picture and compare it to this guy, uh, this is Bell's roadside skipper from what Stone Creek Conservation Area. Um, they look remarkably similar, don't they? Uh, so this genus is kind of interesting because as a genus, they're pretty easy to identify. Uh, if you look at the hind wings here, uh, you can see the black and white checker, checker pattern. And then if you look at the antenna, you'll see that checker pattern repeated. Um, there's not any other skippers in the state that do that. So getting down to the genus of a roadside skipper, Amblyscurtes, is fairly easy. But both ro uh, Bell's roadside skipper and Linda's roadside skipper are essentially co-occur. They're sympatric throughout the state. They both like uh, creeks, uh, waterways, wherever their host plant grows. And it's the same host plant. It's uh, creek oats, uh, river oats, chasmanthium latifolium. And so not only you have a species that's rare, but it's got another species that looks pretty darn similar. And um, so you can see here the result of 10 years of work with this species. Uh, the yellow stars are locations for the species. And of these, I should say, only the three in western Missouri are thought to be extant. The two around St. Louis, despite being extensively collected historically, we can't find any records um, in the St. Louis area. So those of you who are in the St. Louis area who are looking for a challenge, uh, head out to, oh gosh, any of the conservation areas down along the Merrimack and look for a little black triangle that likes to sit perched on leaves waiting for females. Um, so we got three extant sites for this species. It is federally petitioned. We've got a few more years to find it. But adding to the challenge is the fact that generally when we find this species, it doesn't occur in large numbers. You know, the rattlesnake master boromorph we talked about being found in the thousands on certain prairies. Linda's roadside skipper, um, I've never personally seen more than a couple at a site. We've had reports of maybe up to six, but you know, it's not occurring in large populations. It's not a conspicuous species. Um, flies in probably late April to the end of May, and uh, could be really anywhere. Um, the dots on the counties here are all the counties in which uh, creek oats occurs. So you can see that our search target is, is rather large. And if you're familiar with that plant, it's a plant that occurs pretty commonly. You know, it's not like you can track down a patch of the plant and hope to find the species. You really, at this point, I feel like just have to get lucky and be in the right place at the right time. So 
moving from a species that seems to be really rare. Well, let me add one more thing. So <clears throat> Oklahoma has been working on this species as well, and to compound the problems of IDing them in person, they're also finding that the DNA on them doesn't always resolve as nicely as we would hope. And that of the um, you know, 30 or 40 specimens they collected, only about 60% of the ones that morphologically they thought were Linda's roadside skipper actually were Linda's roadside skipper. So not only do we need to figure out the morphological characters for this species, but we still need some more DNA work, which is out of my wheelhouse, but hopefully somebody out there can. Um, so we'll move on to an even more rare species. And if anybody finds this species, a good specimen of it, um, man, I'll buy you dinner. So this is the Ozark Woodland Swallowtail, Papilio jonae. Uh, it's currently ranked as G3 uh, and status unknown within the state of Missouri. But that being said, we don't have a good record of this species since 2006. So if you work with butterflies at all, this species looks remarkably similar to the black swallowtail, which probably is in most of our yards. If you grow dill, um, anything in the carrot family, you, or Queen Anne's lace on a roadside, you'll get black swallowtails pretty commonly. Ozark woodland swallowtail has evolved within the same mimicry group as black swallowtails and the other swallowtails, but it's actually more closely related to Papilio mashon, um, a Western species, and has kind of converged on this same color pattern here. So, Again, this thing is another Ozark species, the Ozark woodland swallowtail. It's named after Joan Heitzman, uh, Richard Heitzman's wife. He described the species from the Warsaw area around Sherman State Park. And, uh, you know, he was really good at finding them, um, way better than I am. So if you look at a box of this species, and I will say this is the only way I've seen this species is in old collections, these were all reared from eggs by Richard Heitzman. And um, then he'd pin them up and uh, put them in the museum. So we would have lots of specimens, but you can see that there's a lot of variation. here. So when we identify a cryptic species, um, it has a lot of morphological variability. Our job gets a lot harder. So for photos of black swallowtails that, you know, may have some of the characteristics we think of for Ozark woodland swallowtail. Unfortunately, a photo is not sufficient. We're going to have to run DNA work on this thing um, to figure out that it's not a black swallowtail, um, which further adds to the challenge. Richard Heisman once stated that the best way to identify this character, this species, is that if you see a swallowtail and it flies into the woods, it's probably Ozark woodland swallowtail. If it flies into the open, then it's a black swallowtail. And if you chase butterflies for any amount of time, there's an awful lot of swallowtails that fly into the woods, um, but they may fly up high. Uh, they may be out of reach. You know, there's a number of butterflies that essentially are canopy dwellers that uh, may feed on oak galls and aphid dew and or hun aphid honeydew and other things up in the canopy of trees, uh, and we might not ever see them. Um, so there's still hope that this species is out there. But as time goes on, you know, we're now. 18 years since this species has last been seen in the wild. Um, so we're due. Somebody on this webinar um, should start collecting swallowtails and maybe we'll find it. So unlike the black swallowtail we talked about, which will eat, you know, wild dill and Queen Anne's lace and really common weedy carrots, this thing almost exclusively feeds on members of the carrot family that grow in the woods. It is the woodland swallowtail after all. So we've got range maps here for Zizia, for Tinidia, um, you know, all putative hosts, um, host plants that eggs have been collected off of by Heitzman. And you can see that there's really not a lot of geographic limitation to where this thing might occur. Essentially, we've got the entire Ozarks as our search area. Um, <clears throat> again, records from the same areas in St. Louis um, with insects, a lot of times, if you look at our distributional maps, it looks like St. Louis and Kansas City and the Springfield area are, are where these species occur, but it's not. It's it's primarily where the collectors occur. Um, if you've got to drive three hours to go look for a species, you're less likely to do it 
on a daily basis than if it's you know half an hour away from your house. So urban areas tend to be pretty heavily collected. Uh, we get out into you know the wilds of the Ozarks, and our knowledge is is more and more lacking as you get further away from the urban and you know from the touristy areas even you get out into some of these spots and you know we don't know if anybody's ever collected there and we don't know what's out there which makes it essentially very difficult to manage for biodiversity all right so that is kind of the end of a few lepidoptera slides and i'll take a look at some of the questions um so Melissa's is easiest to answer. Bird is the person that described rattlesnake master Boromoth in 1917. Uh, it's a pretty common convention. I think uh, lipid, or entomologists tend to use that more because you get many different people uh, describing the same species sometimes. So you got to track who described it first in which journal and what years. That way you know what actual name to put on these things. We talk a lot about how scientific names don't change, but in reality, um, they can change quite a bit. Uh, prescribed burning is a very interesting question. I'm going to punt on that until later in the talk, because that is a very big concern within vertebrate conservation. But um, I hope to also demonstrate that uh, prescribed burning is essential for insect conservation. I don't include humans uh is wildlife in the state of missouri there's certainly some wild folks out here um but addition of one species wouldn't change the pie chart too much yeah cobweb skippers are also very rare um, there's also several species of amblyscurities that feed on cane down in the southeast that are rare at least on the state level um and they're not terribly common globally um just trying to hit some of the highlights and then a question about collecting. Um, technically, to, to pursue wildlife on public land, you would need a collecting permit. And to pursue any of the species we've talked about today, they're all species of conservation concerns. So they are protected by Missouri statute. Uh, you would need a collector's permit to collect them. Now, that being said, most of the collecting of any insects within the state occurs um, without any permits, without even our knowledge. There was a talk at the Entomological Society of America conference this last fall, where a guy, the bee researcher from Utah, estimated that about 7 billion bees are killed on a daily basis uh, by cars on roadways. Um, when we look at that impact and you know extrapolate it out to other taxa, the impact from collectors is, is pretty minimal for any mobile species. Um, you know, we certainly don't want to wantonly destroy anything that's rare and endangered. But sometimes we need the specimens both for morphological and for DNA purposes. Um, we can do, they, not we, they, other people can do DNA using as little as a leg off of some of these species. And um, if we have a full specimen, we'll often send off a leg to get the DNA analyzed. Um, sometimes more is better. <clears throat> Ooh, ash trees. That's a good one. I'm going to defer on that just because I have a lot. If we have a little bit of time at the end, we'll talk about um, some of the impacts from emerald ash borer and the like. All right, I'm going to move on to the next part. But we're talking about other pollinators. I tried to stick it with uh, as charismatic megafauna as we get in the invertebrate world. Um, so primarily, this section of the talk is going to be a little bit of an advertisement for the Missouri Bumblebee Atlas. If you're at all interested in insects, uh, this is a wonderful way to get acquainted with them, to get your hands on some specimens in a non-destructive manner, and to get to learn um, some of the friendly charismatic species that are in your backyard and are in our wild areas. Missouri Bumblebee Atlas is a joint project with the Xerces Society, the University of Missouri at Columbia, and the Missouri Department of Conservation um, that we launched in 2015 to try to get a handle on what our bumblebee, well, 2020, sorry, what our bumblebee populations look like. So this work was precipitated by, again, a couple species being petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. 
well, there's three petition species now, the American bumblebee, the Great Plains bumblebee, and uh, the variable cuckoo bumblebee. So all the three of these are candidates for listing under the Endangered Species Act. But when, as we've already talked about, when I'm approached with that, I first say, whoa, 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 hold on. We don't know where these things are. We don't know how they're doing. You know, we only got our first full-time like pollinator ecologist last last year, 2023. And, uh, you know, we simply don't have a lot of data on these things to even be able to discern distribution and abundances, much less trends. Um, so the bumblebee atlas is, is an attempt to get a handle on all of those things for the bumblebee species that occur within Missouri. So the bumblebee atlas will be running through 2025 at least. If we get more funding, it may go longer. Um, it's hard to say on that one. But it's an all-volunteer project. So um, the University of Missouri at Columbia does all the IDs of the species. They'll verify anything anybody brings in. And um, But the vast majority of the work is just done by interested parties. They adopt a grid cell somewhere around the state. They go out maybe three or four times a year. They'll collect up to 20 bumblebees, put them on ice, and uh, take some pictures, and then uh, let it go and everybody's happy and they send those pictures in and that allows us to know well, they also take some notes about where they are in terms of habitat and um, then they send us all that information so we can start to discern where these species occur who they're occurring with and uh, you know over the course of the project we'll get an idea about trajectories and trends now will mentioned if you want to know more about this you should go to the website you might want to write it down now or we just published uh, the lead article in The Conservationist, the cover photos of a bumblebee this year. And uh, the article talks a lot about the bumblebee atlas. So if you think you're interested, please take a look and go to the website and sign up. We definitely need a lot more information. But you can see that we've already got far more observations and uh, data than I could ever hope to collect on my own. We're talking several thousand observations a year spread out across the state. Um, it's really harnessing the collective power of interested individuals uh, for conservation purposes. So it's, it's great. So when we talk about bumblebee conservation, we really need to keep in mind the life cycle of bumblebees. Um, so any individual bumblebee you see in your yard at any given time is not likely to have an impact on bumblebee populations. And that's a hard thing to get your head around, especially from a conservation standpoint. So we're probably familiar with honeybees and that they have these perennial hives that you know have a queen that will lay egg for years. And you know, all of the bees that we see out and about are just workers and drones working to to feed um, to feed the queen to keep the colony alive. Bumblebees are somewhat similar. They're called, they're not social insects, they're called eusocial, and that they form their colonies on a yearly basis. So in this graph, please start at the winter. And you can see that mated queen overwintering in some leaf litter. We're there now. You know, those bumblebee queens are just out there somewhere, tucked under a rock, maybe a mouse hole, maybe just in some leaves. We don't really know. We don't find a lot of queen bumblebees that are overwintering. If you do find any, let us know. That's very uh, good data to have, good observations. So that queen will kind of break dormancy in the spring. Um, not quite yet, you know, it's only February, but another month, another couple months, probably April, um, those queens will start emerging and they'll they'll feed for a few weeks out in the wild, but then they'll find a hollow log, a mouse hole, a wren house, um, basically in a cavity. And then they'll hole up there and they'll start making these wax pots uh, where they provision and then they lay eggs. And as those eggs hatch, those eggs that hatch are the bumblebees that we see throughout the rest of the year. The queen generally doesn't do a whole lot of foraging beyond the first month or so of life. Instead, it's her, her offspring that then bring food back and start to really grow the colony. And reproduction in bumblebees doesn't happen again until the fall. So as the end of the colony comes forth, and it varies by species, some of the common species like um, 
Bombus Cresiaculus, the brown belted, belted bumblebee, will be producing the first uh, reproductives maybe in June or July. Um, they're kind of an early season species. But for Bombus pennsylvanicus, it's definitely in the fall. And so as the colony gets enough resources, it starts to produce reproductives. It produces next year's queens and it produces males. So those males fly off and find another colony, mate with some uh, queens that are out there, and then those queens overwinter again. So really the recolony is like the reproductive unit and it can fail at any time due to drought, due to lack of pollen, due to pesticides, due to um, you know mowing, due to you name it, a badger digging it up, who knows. Um, but if it gets interrupted at any time in this process, that whole effort is wasted, right? There's no no coming back once the colony is destroyed mid-season. It's just done for. And so oftentimes when colonies are under stress even, they produce reproductives earlier in the year. Um, this is esoteric, but it's important to keep in mind because we're not particularly concerned with saving a single bee here. You know, the single bee really doesn't have that great of an impact. Each colony can have a hundred worker bees in it. So, you know, they expect to lose a number of them, but it's really getting through the entire cycle um, that they need floral resources. They need good weather. They need to not be disturbed. It's a lot. It's a lot to ask for. And so the threats facing bumblebees are myriad. Um, this, this map is a model. Um, and as the saying goes, all models are wrong. Some are useful. This does demonstrate where Threats to bumblebees are highest. And uh, if you take a look at this map, you'll pretty quickly realize that it correlates really well with the prevalence of agriculture on the landscape. Um, so bumblebees are susceptible to diseases. A lot of these diseases are spread by greenhouse bumblebees. If you eat tomatoes in the winter, uh, tomatoes are only pollinated by, by bumblebees, by new world bees that have the ability to buzz pollinate. Honeybees do not. Um, New world plant needs new world bees. We raise these crops in greenhouses and put the bees in there. And lo and behold, when you isolate a species and put it in a vacuum, it develops disease problems and those spill out in the wild. Habitat loss is a big one. Um, 100, a colony of 100 bees in a given time needs a lot of floral resources. <clears throat> Competition from exotic species. Primarily here, we're thinking the uh, European honeybees. It's essentially livestock, um, in my opinion. Um, they wouldn't do very well without us maintaining them. Um, but those honeybees also compete with our native bees. In fact, um, you know, a, it's thousands and thousands of native bees that one hive of honey, we use about the same resources as one hive of honeybees. Poor quality food from exotic plants, from, you know, just not the ideal plants. And then, you know, herbicides and insecticides in particular are really detrimental to these guys. Neonicotinoids are a systemic insecticide that's used primarily, well, it's used in agricultural quite a bit. It's used as a seed coating on corn and soybeans when they're planted. It's used on uh, garden plants you might buy at a nursery um, because it really does prevent any, any insect from getting after that plant, it's incorporated into the tissue of the plant. We find it in the nectar of the plant. We even find it in the pollen of the plant. Um, and it's essentially everywhere at this point. <clears throat> so the rusty patch bumblebee has been a poster child for bee conservation. Once it was the first mainland bee listed as uh, an endangered species. We have exactly one record of rusty patch bumblebee from Missouri and more than likely it was introduced in the St. Louis area in an urban environment. And it was probably brought in on some rootstock from out of state. Um, nobody's seen it for 20 years here, um, but it has raised a lot of awareness. And uh, hopefully that awareness can spill over into some of our other species like this one, the American bumblebee. Um, so this is one of the larger bumblebee species that you're gonna see out there uh, and predominantly a late season species. If you're still seeing bumblebees in October, um, it's very likely this species, they tend to go a lot later than any others. And I mentioned here that they're a long-tongued bumblebee. And I just want to take a quick second to talk about why that's important. Um, so every flower is different. Um, and as we think about things like red clover, if you look at those um, 
collections of flowers, you know, a bee kind of has to work to get pretty deep into there. Um, species like the European honeybee don't do as well with pollinating red clover as our long tongued bumblebees do. And, you know, that pattern extends across entire plant suites. You know, as you go through this next summer, you're looking at different flowers, um, take a look at kind of where they store the nectar and what it takes to get in there. Um, bumblebees work really hard to learn uh, how to manipulate different plants. You think of something like a uh, Baptisia, a wild indigo, a bumblebee actually has to force that flower open to get to the nectar and uh, the pollen. I like to think of um, the different flowers as being like different restaurants and um, things like Queen Anne's Lace or the Golden Corral of restaurants. You know, anybody's welcome and as much as you can eat as long as the food lasts. Whereas Baptisia is a, a far more specialized plant. You know, it's more like the, the fancy French restaurant where I'm not allowed. You gotta have a shirt and a tie and a coat to get in there. And, um, you know, the bumblebees are the, the special visitors for those plants. So these plants and insects have really intricate relationships, which we're only gonna touch the very surface of today. So when this species was first petitioned, we kind of took a look at um, where, where, where it was. That's always the first question. It's like, where is this thing? How do we find it? And, you know, has it changed over time? So you can see here two maps comparing collections from the last 30 years to just collections from the last 10 years. And you can see that uh, the American bumblebee is still widely distributed in the state, which is, is really encouraging. Um, but we also have evidence that it's still out there. It's still around, but the numbers may have declined pretty drastically. Um, um, the best example we have of this is at Dunn Ranch up in Harrison County, owned by the Nature Conservancy. Um, over the course of you know five or ten years, um, the populations of American bumblebee at this site alone uh, crashed from about seventy-two percent of bumblebee collections down to four percent. Um, so while it's still widely distributed, the numbers well, are not what they once were. And you can see on the map on the left there that the range has also contracted pretty substantially. Um, a big question here is sampling effort on those maps, but that's what the Bumblebee Atlas aims to get at. So this is a map of our Bumblebee Atlas collections for the American Bumblebee. And you can see, like we thought, thankfully, it's still widely distributed across the state. Um, similar to what I was talking about earlier, you can almost make an argument that it's uh, prefers urban areas, right? It's doing really well in St. Louis, Columbia, Rala. Um, but again, sampling bias, you know, it's where the collectors are, not where the insect is. So American bumblebee is still out there, we think. Uh, maybe not in the numbers, but at least we're able to find it. And the Great Plains bumblebee, Bombus fraternus, is another one um, that's been petitioned for listing. As opposed to the American bumblebee, this one is a short tongue. And uh, one thing to note on this species is look how flat the hairs look compared to the American bumblebee. This thing really is sleek. And this is a grassland specialist. Um, occurs on tall grass prairies throughout the state, predominantly in the southwest, northwest, um, but even in the city of St. Louis, there's records of this thing from Calvary Cemetery, a uh, remnant prairie in the city. Uh, so it just needs grasslands. And, you know, it's not particularly... It does well on native grasslands, but it does well on introduced grasslands too. And so this is our bumblebee atlas results for Bombus fraternus. You can see, like I described, North Missouri, Southwest Missouri, and then the St. Louis area again. And then another little grouping in the boot heel. Um, that's, we definitely need more surveyors down there. If anybody lives in Southeast Missouri, I really encourage you to sign up for the Bumblebee Atlas or Southwest Missouri for that matter. Springfield area is pretty underrepresented. Uh, it's probably out there, I'm pretty sure it is, but uh, we need more records. So Springfield, Poplar Bluff, Cape, it's your turn. Let's find this guy. One success story for the Bumblebee Atlas is this guy, the half black bumblebee, Bombus Vegans. Uh, we really thought this thing was extirpated. Um, it was even listed on our Species of Conservation Concern checklist as extirpated. Then over the course of the Bumblebee Atlas, we found it. Uh, seven sightings in 2021, uh, four sightings in 2022, um, which just goes to show that when these species are really rare, you know, the one or two people we have working on it um, just may not come across it no matter how much time we spend looking. 
But if we get hundreds of people looking, we're more likely to come across these really rare species. And that's probably what it's going to take to understand more about uh, the half black bumblebee in Missouri. Um, this thing's also declining in other parts of the Midwest. Uh, so definitely one we need to keep an eye on. Here's those records. It's kind of a weird distribution. Uh, a couple in North Missouri, but then scattered, and I guess the Ozark border area along the Missouri River. Um, but it really could be could be anywhere. So you, know, you sign up for the Bumblebee Atlas, you may get you know one of ten records for a rare species. That's something to write home about. So part of the atlas is that we also track you know what floral associates, what flowers the bumblebees are found on. And so you can see here kind of the most frequently visited plants by bumblebees are clovers, uh, wild bee balm, thistles, milkweeds, goldenrods, blazing stars, asters, uh, all these plants that we think of as being good for pollinators. But you know what? It's really good to have data to back that up. Because just because we see a bee on a flower one time, it kind of makes an impression We're like, oh, Bombus pensilanicus really likes bee balm. But when we have 219 records, that carries a little bit more weight. So a lot of really great data coming out of the bumblebee atlas that's going to really increase our bumblebee conservation efforts. And then the last note I have on bumblebees, I think, is that, you know, not all plants are created equal for any pollinator. You know, a lot of our native bees are really specific on a particular plant. Um, you know, there's ones that are particular to wild geranium, to, you know, hawthorns, to you name it. It probably has a specialist bee that really visits almost exclusively those flowers. But what we're looking at here is sunflower pollen. Um, this has been getting a lot of attention lately, a lot of study, because sunflower pollen, if you look at it, it's real spiky. And it turns out that those spikes are really good at killing the bacteria that infest bees, that infest bumblebees. So sunflower pollen is, is self-medicating for bumblebees. They'll preferentially visit sunflowers. Um, bee balm is another one that you might think the name bee balm is an old wives' tale, but it turns out it has chemicals that the bees actually use to rid themselves of disease. So all that starts to tie in to later in the talk when you know, managing insects is really about managing diversity. And for a lot of times it's managing plant diversity. All right, are there any bee questions? Oh my gosh, there's a lot of questions. Yeah, so neonics or neonicotinoids are, are definitely detrimental. Um, gosh, I guess I should be careful saying that. They're, they have an impact on these species. Um, a lot of times it's not a lethal direct impact. You know, if they touch pollen or they ingest some pollen that has neonicotinoids in it, it most likely won't kill the bee outright. But it's kind of a cumulative effect that they eventually lose their ability to navigate to find their way back to the hive. Um, one bumblebee, one particular individual bumblebee will learn, you know, to work only maybe one or two flowers over the course, like species of flowers over the course of its life. and um, you know, there's evidence that neonicotinoids really impair their working memory. So it may may not be able to find the hive, may not be able to find the flower it knows how to open. It may just, it may be impaired. Um, Asian killer hornets are not currently a problem for our bees. We don't have any Asian killer hornets yet in the state of Missouri. Uh, hopefully it stays that way. We do get about a hundred pictures a year of people thinking they have them. Usually they're European hornets. Um, which are exotic and which have really done quite well here, but um, they don't eat nearly the bees that the killer hornet uh, do. Carpenter bees are a native bee, but they are not a bumblebee. So the bumblebees are kind of defined by um, that eusocial behavior, the fact that they form the colonies, whereas carpenter bees act like most of our native bees and that the mom raises her brood. Um, she'll lay eggs in a hole for carpenter bees. It's a hole that she finds and excavates out. Um, you know, there's no sister cooperation. There's no offspring working together to ensure the fitness. You know, every most of our native bees, every egg they lay is fertile, and it turns into either a, a male or or a female that can lay eggs. And that's not the case for bumblebees or or honeybees.
a specific type of sunflowers, you know, they all have a similar pollen. And I would suspect they all function pretty equivalently, but uh, I don't actually know the answer to that. I think most of the work that's been done with them is actually on the annual sunflower, the common ornamental, um, which is probably native to really west of Missouri, but I don't think you'll go wrong ever planting sunflowers. Um, all right, so let's take a few. I'm not going to get through nearly what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, let's talk about regal fertilities for about five minutes. So this is a iconic prairie dependent butterfly, one of the largest, prettiest, and you know easiest to see and identify if you're in the right spot butterflies that we have in the state. Um, and it is a prairie obligate. You know this species is is only found on the prairies. Uh, and uh, it needs the prairies to survive, and we don't actually know why. Um, there's some evidence that, you know, they don't like to fly across roads. Um, they will fly across roads. They will fly across tree lines. They just don't like to. Um, they're really just like large tracts of unbroken prairie where they do really well. Unfortunately, anybody that um, is in this audience probably already knows that we're down to, you know, less than 1% of our native prairie. And so those large tracts of unbroken land are, are pretty much gone. Um, as opposed to the bumblebee life cycle, and actually unusually for a butterfly or for a lepidoptera, um, real fritillaries overwinter as a caterpillar. So they overwinter as really tiny caterpillar, about a millimeter long. Um, they're out there right now on the prairie, just a millimeter in size, tucked under a bunch of grass, trying to, trying to survive this uh, crazy negative 13 to 70 in two weeks, uh, as well as we are. You know, that caterpillar will emerge out of hibernation in the spring, usually around early April, and it feeds on violets, only violets for the regal fritillary. And it seems to be particular violets, but we're starting to have some doubts about that. Um, they pupate in June. And then if you want to see um, the adult you have to be out on the prairies from about mid-June through September, kind of depending on the year. We've had them as early as May. And um, it's important to note that, you know, males and females act very differently in this species. The males um, are the showy ones. They're the ones that are always flying around looking for a female. The females, they only live about three weeks. The females are the ones that live all the way through September. And they generally don't lay eggs until late August or September. So they emerge a week or two after the males and then essentially will just hang out in the prairie. They don't feed very much. It's almost like an estivation where they're just waiting for temperatures to cool down, maybe for violet leaves to reemerge. And then they start laying their eggs out on the prairie. Those eggs hatch in the fall. And then those little caterpillars wander off as far as they can, you know, an inch or two and uh, try to find a place to hunker down and survive. So here's some of the violet species that uh, regal fritillaries use. We think some of the most common food sources are um, prairie violet, viola pedatifida, viola sagittata, the arrow leaf violet, viola pedata, the bird's foot violet, they do seem to use occasionally. And we do have one or two records here of them using common violet, viola sororia, which we probably all have in our yards or somewhere within a stone throw of our house. And even in other parts of the country, they use even Johnny Jump Ups, the little uh, weedy annual that may or may not be native, depending on who you want to talk to this week. So fire, promise we talk about fire. Um, if we know anything about prairies, we know that these is a fire maintained landscape. And when I first started working with regal fritillaries, I thought, well, surely they have some adaptation to, to dealing with fire. You know, uh, Atoe skippers make a little silk cocoon and bury themselves underground it can survive fire pretty well and the answer as far as i've been able to determine is no regal fritillaries do not have an adaptation to fire um they are if they're not consumed within the fire then they're going to be really prone to drying out essentially you know all that leaf litter does help to hold moisture at the surface level these larvae are really susceptible to desiccation and um you know fire is bad for them on an individual level. But also without fire, we can't maintain prairie. Um, there's no amount of mowing, hand clipping, or herbicide treatment that's going to replicate what fire does on the prairie. And so 
it's really important, like we talked about for Rattlesnake Master Boar Moth, that we use all of our tools judiciously. Um, if we were to burn entire landscapes at once, we would run the risk of extirpating not only regal fritillaries, but, you know, any of these species could easily be knocked out. You know, insects in general follow different life strategies than, than we do. Um, they produce lots of offspring. A female regal fritillary can raise, you know, 1,200 eggs. Um, so it's really counting on, you know, maybe it might lose half of those. It might lose 1,000 eggs. But you know what? It still may have 200 that survive um, if we leave the right places for them to survive. That includes leaving prairie and it includes leaving unburned parts of the prairie that have violets. Um, you know, so regal fritillaries were first petitioned for listing back in the 90s. And uh, our populations and distributions have essentially not changed in the last 30 years, indicating that a rotational fire program is adequate, as far as we know, to maintain invertebrates on the landscape. Of course, we don't know what we've lost. Um, we don't even know how to determine that. Well, there's just one last shot of this iconic species. Um, if you haven't been out to see them and you're at all interested in insects, uh, you should. Um, While well, you still can. My personal pet working theory is that populations of not only this species, but others are declining uh, due to climate change. And really the driving factor seems to be our wintertime snow cover. Um, as we talked about, they're really prone to desiccation and uh, having snow on the ground keeps a relatively constant humidity level like ground layer. And as our snowpack becomes less and less predictable, um, I think we're starting to see this species decline. We've already documented it disappearing out of some of the southern tiers of Missouri, Oklahoma, and uh, could very well be marching north. Now, we do have a experimented the last few years with a rearing program for regal fritillaries. Uh, Dr. Chris Barnhart down at Missouri State uh, has reared thousands of these guys now and uh, is one of the, subsequently, is one of the world experts on re raising regal fritillaries. And if you get a chance to check out one of his talks, I highly encourage it. Just want to mention it here. So this slide just goes to demonstrate how little we know. So we track within the Heritage Database, that's our, what we call the database that has all of our rare plant and animal information in it. We track about a third of our mammals, about a third of our breeding birds, about a quarter of our vascular plants. We track less than 1% of our insects. And we've talked about a lot of them today. And you've probably seen how, how many questions there are still to be answered. But just know that these are the ones that we kind of know more about because we've been looking. We have distributional information. We have developed some life history information. Um, that leaves 99% of, of these taxa. That, how are they doing? Hopefully, well, we don't know. We're trying. Um, so we currently track 154 different species of insects. I didn't talk about them all. Uh, I'm gonna run a little late, guys. You can cut me off if you want. So now we're getting into the hands-on part. So who cares, right? I mean, we're losing these insects. Some of them are pretty. Rattlesnake Master Blower Moth. I don't know if you think that one's pretty or not, but you know, these things all have implications on the landscape. These are the primary food source for so many different uh, parts of life. Doug Ptolemy's later on this webinar series, and check his out. He'll build on this part more. So I'm going to go quickly through it because he is far better at it than I am. But the first thing we can all do is plant native species. Um, there's 2,000 native species in the state of Missouri. And a lot of them are really beautiful. A lot of them are really showy. And the benefit they have is that they support life. They support these insects. Um, you know, things like Bradford pear, which is now maybe part of legislation and not be allowed to be sold anymore. It supports, you know, a handful of moth species, as opposed to an oak, which may support 800 different species of Lepidoptera. Um, that's how food chains get built, is by supporting insects on plants. Exotic plants don't do it. You got to plant native wherever you can. Um, if you're going to plant one, plant, plant something that's going to last far greater than your lifetime. Plant an oak tree. Um, but for ornamentals, there's something that suits your purposes. That it's something that looks wonderful and that will draw these things into your landscape and help keep them around. 
and plant diverse. You know, I'm not saying all of our yards need to look like a conservation area with 300 different species in them. That would be wonderful, but I don't think we're going to get there. But when you consider things like bumblebees that, you know, basically need floral resources from May till October in order to produce um, next year's queens, if you don't have a diverse landscape, they're not going to have the floral resources necessary to survive. So the more species you can get in your landscape, the better you can do. Um, you know, if you've got large acres, this is easy to accomplish. It's harder on a, on a excuse me, urban or suburban lot. This one's my favorite one. And number, one of the main things we can do is be lazy. You know, if you mow less frequently, you'll get more flowering plants in your yard. You use less herbicide. You'll get things like dandelions and your neighbors may not like it and they're not the best for bees but it's better than just fescue it's better than just bluegrass and it means you get more of your life back you can spend it you know whatever you ladies like to do watching bees watching a baseball game however you want to spend your time instead of just mowing your lawn instead of treating it with herbicide um this is the number one impact you get to do less work and get more benefit out of it be lazy um, yeah, so letting the milkweeds grow up and next to your sidewalk, you get monarchs right there. Letting the dandelions go, you can get bees moving in. Um, you know, if you have a dozen weedy species in your lawn, you're going to start supporting life where previously there was none. And what do you have to do? Less. Win-win. Um, throwing in a throw a shout out here for one species you should consider planting, and that's wild plum. Wild plum is a really underutilized species uh, horticulturally in the landscapes. It supports 456 different species of Lepidoptera. You know, it's got really showy flowers in the spring. It smells good. It makes fruit that we can eat. Um, any place you're taking out honey, so consider putting in wild plum in its place. Start building the foundations of life around you. Plant milkweeds. You know, I don't. Probably need to sell you on the virtue of supporting monarchs at this point. Um, they're solely feed on milkweeds as caterpillars. And that's primarily to get those really nasty chemicals, the cardiac glycosides that milkweeds produce, sequester them so that way they're not able to be eaten by birds. Um, we know this story for monarchs, but regal fritillaries sequester chemicals from violets as well, called violinum. Provides them with some chemical defense. You know, these are really intricate ancient relationships. Um, they've been building for thousands and thousands of years. And all we have to do to take advantage of them is put some seeds in the ground. Asters are another wonderful one. We talked about how sunflowers, I mean aster in the broad sense, the aster family. Sunflowers, you know, have the, the spiky pollen, but there's a whole suite of butterflies that, you know, feed on asters as caterpillars. <clears throat> and obviously the flowers of things like purple cone flower and the, the bidens here and the sunflowers are also phenomenal for pollinators. You know, the sunflowers support a whole suite of native bees that uh, only feed on helianthus. And uh, you can get them in your yard if you plant the right seeds. That's not to say we got to get rid of all exotics. You know, they have their place. Something like uh, red clover does extremely well in a lawn setting. You just walk away from it. Um, you mow less, you'll get red clover. And uh, this was taken in my backyard in St. Joe. I like to include it in here because, you know, I'm not a purist here. Um, I'm not weeding out every single bloom of red clover, but just letting it go to bloom um, provides food. Butterfly bush is not one I'm recommending here. Um, it does get awfully invasive down in the southeast, and it probably will here too eventually. But, you know, there's hard to argue with the attractive qualities of it. There's natives that do as well, if not better, but, you know, start picking out the ones that do nothing in your yard. Replace those first. And probably the biggest hurdle to managing for insects on a personal level, it's, it's, it's aesthetic. You know, what we're really combating here is this idea that plants have to be pristine. Um, to me, this milkweed getting chowed down by these, on these, by these tussock caterpillars you know, that's, that's life at work. Um, those caterpillars are doing what they were bred to do, what they were meant to do. 
we have developed over time this idea that our lawns have to be uniform. They've got to be weed free. They've got to be tight mode. They've got to look like a golf course um, that our, our perennials around our house, you know, we get little circles cut out of our roses by leaf cutter bees. And like, oh, why are they doing that? They're ruining the roses. No, they're supporting life. This is just a simple mindset change that if we can get our heads around and allow life to thrive around us without resorting to chemical defenses, without trying to pull it out. You know, the number one question I get asked about monarchs is, I've got aphids on my milkweed. What do I do about it? And the answer is nothing. Those aphids are part of the cycle. They're part of the system. They're, they are part of life. You know, something will eat those aphids. You'll have ladybugs move in. You'll have lace wings move in. These things go in cycles. And the more you let it alone and let it go, the more life will grow around you. So with apologies to Doug Tallamy, um, I'm going to close with a comment of his that you should garden as if life depends on it. You know, the, some of these problems are really big scale. Regal fritillaries are going to be hard for any of us, even me, to make an impact on. But on a small scale, we can save small things in our backyards, in our hometowns, in places we live and work. All right, well, that's all I have. So let's see what other questions we have. Steve, you've got questions upon questions. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Would you like us to look in the chat as well as, because I know you're looking in the Q&A. There's a couple yeah. in the chat. Yeah, if you guys want to look at the chat, I'll start with the Q&A. Okay. Um, greenhouse tomato operations and disease spillover. Is this a big issue? Um, yes and no. Like in some respects, it's already too late. The diseases have already moved their way into the wild populations. It's thought to be one of the major drivers of the decline of the rusty patch bumblebee, and it's been implicated in some of the other bumblebee species I talked about. So, you know, if we all stopped buying greenhouse tomatoes today, uh, it wouldn't solve anything. Um, I don't know. I don't like greenhouse tomatoes. They taste like styrofoam. So it's a hard one for me to answer. Um, you know, it's not the end of the world. Can you help me understand why you need to be careful? Oh, talking about neonics. That was mostly just because of my employment. <laughs> um, you know, neonics, like any tool, are useful, right? They are amazingly good at killing insects. Um, I happen to be in the business of insect conservation, so they're not my favorite, but you know, they they have their place in society. We just always need to be careful with our tools, whether it's prescribed fire, whether it's insecticide, you know, whether it's a mower. Um, a tool is only as good as our intention. And um, overuse of any of them is going to have be detrimental. Uh, um, let's see. Yes, regal fertilaries are being raised for reintroduction. We've put them out on eight prairies so far. They aren't doing spectacularly well, but uh, we've got the protocols now. We know how to do it, and we can do it in mass. Um, my hope is always to maintain wild populations um, as wild as we can. Uh, reintroduction is a last resort. We really just wanted to make sure we could do it in case we, um, in case we need to. At this point, we don't need to, so we're not going whole bore forward with reintroductions. Um, because again, we could always inadvertently introduce a disease or any number of off-target effects. You know, there's always, you pull on any, any string in the web and it's going to reverberate. Uh, general comments about cicadas. Yeah, so we've got a big cicada hatch coming up this summer. Um, it's a pretty amazing experience. Last happened in 2011 for Missouri. Mostly we're just going to have the 13-year cicadas, but there are four species in there. Um, you can all you can tell them all apart by ear if you're a birder, which I 
somehow assume that most of the people on this webcast like birds. Uh, seems fair. <laughs> but you can learn to identify birds by songs. You can identify cicadas by songs, too. Give you something else to pay attention to on a slow day, especially, you know, August when not a lot of the birds are being a little bit more quiet. Hey, Steve. Uh, yeah, I have a couple, a couple things from uh, the chat, but I also wanted to address something. Some An anonymous person put in the Q&A before whether or not we give certificates for teachers. Um, and I don't, that was an anonymous question. So I don't know who to answer or if you're still on here or if there's more people that want to know that. Um, we would have to look into DESI approval for these webinars as professional development for teachers. Um, so please reach out to Ethan and I um, by email, which I will now put in the chat. Um, and a, just a quick comment from Jeff here. Latest Bird Hugger podcast had a great 30 minute interview on impacts of neonics on insects and birds. So I thought that sounded like a good reference. That's important for birds, you know, the, those little caterpillars are just nice little sausages, really. Think about That's that. right. Little protein <laughs> snacks. <clears throat> Near native plum trees. Oh, the suckering problems. Yeah. So Prunus Mexicana, the Mexican plum, is far less prone to suckering than the American plum. Um, now, that can be hard to find. Even the ones from our nursery uh, may or may not always be properly labeled. A lot of those are grown from seed that uh, people bring in. Um, people bring us in plums for 60 cents a pound or something, and we grow out those seeds. So we can't often, can't always verify the provenance and the species. Um, there are plums that are non-suckering, but you're right. They do... They do like room. Um, and they'll do rather well as a living hedge or a windbreak if you need something like that. Hayfield with lots of wildflowers. Um, yeah, you know, it really depends on the wildflowers. If they're truly wildflowers, if you're talking about like a CRP, a diverse CRP planting, or maybe even something with some prairie left to it, um, Harvesting later in the season can be really good. Now your forage quality is going to go down. Um, so, you know, a compromise in that situation might be to only harvest two thirds or, you know, leave strips around the edges or through the middle to still provide that pollinator habitat. You know, if you're hanging off an entire 40 or an 80 or I don't know if you get a lot of land even, um, you know, any pollinators that are in that landscape, once you harvest everything out, um, we got to find somewhere to go. In fact, you know, once Sedalia area prairies provide a great example of this, when a lot of the neighbors do their haying, our regal fritillary population on those prairies like goes up by four or five times <laughs> because all the butterflies that were living in those areas all of a sudden got to find some place to go. So, you know, leave what you can, if you can. Um, Steve, that's also true of the birds we noticed when we did a lot of regular weekly work down at the Sedalia area prairies um birds would come over and so um Alexis birds are also important consideration because they'll be nesting and the adults will leave yes but nests will be destroyed of course um so later than July 15th has always been sort of the the rule that I've heard but our nesting yeah. studies show that they're definitely still um, nesting in decent density is through the end of July. Um, some birds are even double brooding in August. I realize it's a trade-off with the nutrition that you're trying to get out of the hay, but another consideration if you can take it into yeah. account. Absolutely. And if you can't manage a later hay, again, just try to leave what you can, right? <laughs> leave something. <clears throat> Cutting back milkweed in June and July, you know, that's something that people have been promoting more and more lately um you know and i'm not sure how i feel about it so most <clears throat> people get really concerned about like monarch caterpillars you find in september and uh, honestly a lot of those guys just aren't going to make it they got their eggs got laid too late i don't know that it's necessarily the best idea to be promoting them to lay eggs on their return migration, 
you know, any eggs that are laid that late probably won't become adults ever. And so it's just wasted resources. Um, yeah. I mean, you're not going to hurt anything doing that on an individual basis. If you want to see them, then by all means do it. And then can you share my contact info? Absolutely. Uh, chat, the best place to pop that probably. There was a question much higher up in the chat, Steve. Um, it was when you were talking about the Bumblebee Atlas and like how important data collection is. And someone asked about iNaturalist and if uh, has that helped entomologists? Yeah. Um, so disclaimer, I, I don't really do iNaturalist. I always view it as like a John Casey thing where the machines are going to put me out of work. They're going to learn to identify and everything and my skill set will be worthless. Um, and the fact of the matter is that insects are pretty difficult to do from photos for the most part. Bumblebees are pretty doable. Um, you know, some of the bigger things, if it's a good photo, yeah, we can ID them. And there have been some great leads um, that we've gotten through iNaturalist. Um, swamp metal mark is a great one. It's a little butterfly that feeds on thistle. It acts like a moth. It hides out under leaves. And right now, kind of the, we think it might be the biggest population in the world is found down at uh, Runge Nature Center in Jeff City. And it was found by um, one of our naturalists there. And he posted it on iNaturalist. And I happened to see it. And I was like, hey, we track that species. It's globally rare. Um, so there's there's a lot of value to that for the things that can be identified. Now, also, please keep in mind that, you know, all these species we're talking about are essentially big insects. You know, a lot of the diversity is really tiny. And those things never show up on iNaturalist, or if they do, they're extremely difficult to identify. So it's a it's a good tool. Um, I just don't have the energy to do it. Um, Steve, a little bit up in the Q and A, uh, just Jack made a comment that the half black bumblebee, which I have got a comment, was like really cute. Um, doesn't seem to show functional wings given its size. Is that just a function of the picture? Or? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't recall anything. I mean, I they know. are they are flighted, of course. Yeah. Yeah, they totally fly. Oh yeah, we did have a couple questions about emerald ash borer. Yeah, so this is a really tricky one for me to answer. Um, you know, obviously the emerald ash borer threatens the very existence of ash trees um, over the long run on our landscape. Like they'll probably exist as small trees. Um, and you know, I'm not an expert on on this species or the off-target impacts, but um, there are a number of like buprestids of jewel beetles and other cerambicids, longhorn beetles that uh, are exclusive on ash. And so some of the, obviously their existence is threatened by the existence of their old ash borer. Their host disappears. Um, there's all kinds, I mean, there's a lot of leps, a lot of uh, underwing moss and everything. Um, if ash disappears, they're going to disappear. Um, the only functional way we thought of to control emerald ash borer is the releasing of parasitic wasps. And uh, some of these parasitic wasps will also target related jewel beetles, related boo prestids. Um, and talking with coworkers, with um, you know national boo prestid experts, we kind of made the decision to okay releases of the controls for emerald ash borer because we may lose a few other species to these parasitic wasps that they target off, you know, off target effects, but it probably pales in comparison to the number of species that depend on ash, that if we lost ash from our landscape, we might lose over a hundred species. And I'm making that up, but <laughs> um, we'll lose a lot of species compared to, you know, if we lose a few species to parasitic wasps. So unfortunately at this point, with like with so many things, um, the beetle is out of the bag. You know, and so we're left with two bad choices on what to do about it. And really the best solution to all these things is to 
put more time and energy into preventing them from being introduced, from becoming established. Um, time spent in early monitoring and early treatment is, you know, way more effective than spending thousands of dollars per tree treating it um, to keep rumbled ash borers out of a particular tree. You know, we're we're spending a lot of money on band-aids that should be spent avoiding the impacts in the first place. And that's really all I can say about that. It is, it's going to be bad. You know, there's like a leaf miner on a uh, fringe tree that uh, emerald ash borer also affects fringe tree in the same family. And uh, we'll probably lose all the stuff that's uh, particular to fringe trees as well. Well, thank you very much for this and, and uh, toughing it out with us too, uh, <laughs> given the circumstances. But we also appreciate you know taking your time on an evening coming from a state agency. As you know, we're in the NGO world and the non-government world, and we uh, do a lot of focus on birds, and we love to to you know try to tie together the whole ecosystem advocacy. Um, would you be able to recommend any any groups or or those that are into the entomology world that people could maybe support or look at look at or look into or learn more from? Sure, there's uh, I know of three groups that I'll mention offhand. Um, the biggest one is the Xerces Society, which probably most people have heard of if you pay attention to insects at all. They're a national organization. Um, they're one of our partners on the bumblebee atlas. They're really the group advocating for insects on a national scale. Um, if you want to drive attention in that arena, then the Xerces Society is probably your, your best go-to. Uh, I mean, there's the national the NABA, North American Butterfly Association, is another one. Um, but there's also local groups. Um, in Kansas City, you have the Adelia Society, <clears throat> Adelia Society. And then in St. Louis, you have the Webster Groves Nature Study Society and a St. Louis chapter of the North American Butterfly Association. So there's there's local groups. And, you know, I've often found that these local groups are a far more friendly way to get involved. You know, you'll meet people and you'll learn a lot. You can teach them things. And, um, you know, these people, these are the people that, that know things. Like I, when I came back to the state 20 years ago, I got involved with the Webster Grove Nature Society, Study Society and uh, the Native Plant Societies. And uh, I probably learned as much through those groups, through their just boots on the ground experience of being outside and seeing these things as anything I learned in any of my schooling. You know, there's wonderful people out there. There's wonderful resources. Um, you just got to just gotta reach out. Great. Thank you. We'll, we'll be sure to add those in our follow-up list of resources too. I think we covered everything. There was a lot in the Q&A and a lot in the chat, Steve. Thanks a bunch for for hanging with all of us yeah um, my pleasure so all right <laughs> don't see any more questions so we're gonna let everybody go thank you all for coming and good night everybody thanks